This is Viewpoint, a look at vital issues in the Pacific Northwest, broadcast as a public service since 1953. Near the shadow of the state capitol at Olympia, on nearly 1,000 acres of property, Washington's newest four-year institution of higher education is being tested. The Evergreen State College will soon graduate its first full-fledged class. 230 young men and women will be handed degrees from a facility caught in a conflict over survival. Evergreen was created in the late 60s with a philosophy to, and I quote, develop a true learning community that reflects the nature of the real world, where none of the problems man faces is simple, and where none of the parts becomes in its own conception more important than the whole, end quote. For the 1,800 students and 100 faculty members, this is alternative education. In the fishbowl of Olympia, the visibility is high, and critics and supporters are heard. The student-operated radio station carries the call letters CHAOS, K-A-O-S, and the program schedule mirrors the campus itself, from the classics to bluegrass, W.C. Fields hands Christian Anderson to Daniel Berrigan and Dick Gregory. There is a revolution in the educational approach at the Evergreen State College. The most visible is the fact that there is no structured grading system. The credit, no credit portfolio approach is tough for traditionalists to swallow. Little known is the fact that the faculty at Evergreen is unique in their approach. They voted as a body not to establish the tenure system. No job is protected and the staff wants it that way. On most any given day, the campus can be seen as the center for a spontaneous event, and the popularity of bluegrass music is reflected here. There is approximately $42 million tied up in the physical plant at the Evergreen State College. A new capital expenditures amounting to $8.5 million has been approved by the legislature. And this week, the new recreational plant was dedicated by Governor Dan Evans. But the legislature has not been so kind to Evergreen in the operational budget. A knife was taken to the biennium request for $17.5 million. After considerable trimming, just over $10 million was left. This has forced a hold on uh, enrollment and also cuts in the administrative staff. <laughs> State Representative Ken Eikenberry of Seattle toured the campus during the recent legislative session. He is quoted as saying, I really see no reason to keep it in operation. The Republican lawmaker claims that it's a nice hotel, but to quote him, I'd like to see some education going on there. The president of the college, Charles McCann, faces his critics directly. In a letter to parents in mid-March of this year, the former dean of faculty at Central Washington College says, the closure of Evergreen would be disastrous, not only for a needed variety in Washington's system of higher education, but for the vitality of American education in general. I'm Art McDonald, and on this edition of Viewpoint, we will look at Evergreen with the two men mentioned a moment ago. Representative Eikenberry represents a coalition of state lawmakers who seriously question the value of the new college. President McCann has been with the institution since its bare beginnings. It's under his leadership that the college exists. President McCann, have you survived what might be called the legislative inquiry? I think we have so far. Our I think I have every confidence that we'll continue to. I say that, however, uh, realizing that we ought always to be subject to inquiry. We kind of welcome it, I think. Ken Eikenberry, have you tempered your criticisms that were made public during that legislative session? Do you think it is a value to the state of Washington to have the Evergreen State? 
<clears throat> Art, I agree that it's a value to be willing to innovate, but at the same time, uh, I think it's our duty to judge the innovation, too. And this is uh, one reason I thank you for the invitation to come on this program, this public service program. And uh, I think that, uh, by and large, the, most of the people in the legislature did agree that we should hold the uh, college at its present status for a time being and see if this experiment is going to work out. Uh, a number of people, I think, share with me the question, three really, uh, three concerns. Uh, first of all, are we providing an institution there that if a student uh, decides to go there for four years, will he have the opportunity to get an education that's useful to him? All right, let's stop there. And President McCann, can you answer that? Will it be useful to him if he attends everything? I think if the, the student makes the best use of his or her time at Evergreen, it will be tremendously useful. Does he have the capacity to make the best use of his time? I think it's been proven in the two short years that Evergreen's been in existence that the average student, particularly here in Washington, does have that kind of capacity. Is it a particular kind of student that goes to Evergreen? I think it's a little early to tell. Our admissions requirements, of course, are uh, such that any uh, person graduating in the top half of a high school class who has taken the trouble to read the catalog and put in writing his or her understanding of it can enter Evergreen. So that we've uh, made very sure from the beginning that we're not an elitist institution in that sense. Now, there may be certain character traits over the course of years that, uh, as we look back historically, will seem to uh, tell us whether or not a person can be predicted to do well at Evergreen or not. I think it's a little early to tell that. What brings you to question that then, Ken? Do you think that because they go with a portfolio and uh, uh, credit, no credit, and no A, B, C, D, E, F, traditional kinds of judging and assessment of students? Is that what raises your hackle? Well, a couple of things, and you've mentioned uh, one of them. But uh, basically, it's hard to find out, and I've asked uh, Dr. Berry particularly, who did lobby the legislature during the time we were in session, what is the goal of Evergreen College? What do you, ex do, do you expect to excel in? And I never got uh, an answer. So uh, you mentioned the other subject of grades, and uh, we do have a, quite a study that's been conducted by the University of Washington and Evergreen and two other colleges, uh, funded, interestingly enough, uh, largely from the Associated Student Body at the University of Washington. And this uh, rather comprehensive study really raises a question about the kind of portfolio that Evergreen is trying to use. Now, when was that study conducted, though? Isn't it a key in this? Because the school is really just getting off the ground. It won't be until when? June, that you graduate your first full-fledged class of 230. Well, that's accurate. It was not a study on this kind of system alone. It was on a number of systems. And the reason, for example, the ASUW was interested was because they were considering a pass-fail or credit-no-credit -credit kind of system at the University of Washington. Why did you go? I Go ahead. I, I wonder if I could sure. comment on that. I think probably the study was a valid one in so, so far as the, the associated student body was concerned at Washington in that they were trying to find out whether or not the, the university could go to a credit, no credit, or pass-fail system to a greater extent than they have. So the nature of the study was a, an opinion questionnaire sent out to graduate schools, businesses, other colleges around the country, asking, what would you do if, and so forth. Uh, I think there was a question something like, would, to what extent would you accept credit from an innovative institution? And it was footnoted down at the bottom, Antioch or Evergreen. None of those places, so far as I know, uh, could have had uh, anything from Evergreen to respond to at that moment. 
So it may be all right for the university's purposes and getting other people's attitudes, but insofar as it applies to the Evergreen situation, it's quite invalid. Our <coughs> student credential files since they have been developed, which was well after that study took place, have been checked out with employers, other graduate schools. We had a conference of graduate school deans and graduate uh, department chairmen from places like the University of Washington, the University of California at Berkeley and Santa Barbara, University of Oregon, uh, California State Colleges presented them with some sample student credential files. Uh, I happen to have one here with me. It looks like the usual, except that it's a little unusual in its content. This is what the employer or the graduate school gets. The actual transcript of Evergreen is in it, which isn't a grade transcript, but a detailed summary of what the student was expected to do, how well the student did it in the, in the uh, opinion of the professor. And then there are a couple of samples also of the student's own work in here, since the student is expected to evaluate what he or she got. And if the student has had some kind of off-campus experience, such as an internship, then that person out there on the job puts in writing what their opinion of the, the student is. Employers seem to find this very helpful, as graduate schools do. I suppose. Why then isn't know. it accepted universally? Why don't we have the bigger schools or the smaller schools involved in the pass-fail credit? No, credit? I think it's a matter of tradition. Uh, I don't know to what extent you'd like to turn this discussion uh, into. Uh, you'd like me to go into it. Uh, maybe Marty Wilson would be sore about your taking over what's new in the schoolhouse, but I could talk for hours on, on grades and their history. I, I doubt whether grades themselves have been with higher education for more than uh, 100 years or so. All right, let's, let's not get into yeah. an education ease on this, sure. but let's, let's talk about point two that raises your concern at Evergreen. You were listing three. Well, okay, I, I was going to get to the matter of whether or not the taxpayer is getting the biggest bang out of his education buck, but may I uh, sure. ask uh, Dr. McCann a question here, uh, and I don't claim any expertise whatsoever in education at all, but I was interested to note in the uh, catalog that uh, Evergreen sent out that the uh, apparently the instructor or someone in your registration department does uh, break down the portfolio you send out uh, by credit hours. In other words, uh, you have a total of 36 units to graduate from Evergreen, mm -hmm. but these are translated into the equivalent of quarter credit hours, apparently. That's right. And I'm just wondering, as long as uh, they're going to the trouble of breaking it out that way mm -hmm. and recognizing that even pass or fail is uh, subjective uh, in many respects, mm -hmm. why not go ahead and put a handy tag on it, such as A, B, C, D, or F? Uh, lots of reasons, Mr. Eikenberry. Perhaps I could uh, just begin by making the flat-out statement that it's very difficult to assess anymore what that A, B, C, D, or F says or means. When you and I, when all three of us were in college, I think the system was well accepted and taken for, taken for granted. None of us ever questioned it. But there still were little nagging questions, holes in the carpet, even back then. Uh, what, for example, when a graduate admissions officer was looking at a transcript and saw physics 490 on a transcript, say, when he saw Physics 490 from Harvard with an A, and Physics 490 from East Jabru State U with an A. That where you know, one might have been 
absolutely first rate, and the other might have been the equivalent of a, a good prep school course in, in physics. Even then, back when we were in college, the some student, uh, professors might have had a something up here, a standard that they graded by. Maybe nobody ever reached it in one year, and only one the next year. On the other hand, some other instructors in the same place might have had a bunch of dump coughs in a class, but yet they went on a curve. And the best dump cough in the class got an A. So, you know, Well, are you saying the portfolio then? then is an assessment of the individual? He's not in competition with his fellow classmate because he may be the only one taking that course, in effect, He's or in that internship, or that program. He's in competition with himself, with his own potential capabilities. What's the ta taxpayer look for in bang for the buck, as you put it? Well, uh, to give you an example, uh, if we look over the uh, budget book, which I brought a copy of Don't here. read that, please. I have no intention <laughs> of it. <laughs> but that's what we have, uh, one of the tools we have to work with. Uh, if we look at 7173 expenditures, for example, and compare the expenditures of Evergreen, which were about uh, 2,543 per student for that two-year period, and compare it with Eastern, Central, and, and Washington colleges of education, we find that uh, Evergreen was a little over $1,000 higher than all of those uh, schools. And recognizing the part of this has to be startup cost, I'm just mm -hmm. wondering uh, how long you expect this trend to go on and whether or not you feel that uh, this is really a fair expenditure? Well, I, uh, the answer to the last question is you bet, but to, to go back, the, uh, the presentations we made to the legislature even before Evergreen began, <coughs> excuse me, recognized that there would be startup costs for uh, probably three biennia in beginning the college. But this was assuming a certain rate of growth. Now, when that rate of growth is markedly slowed, then that whole question is sort of reopened again. Is that why, with a cut in budget that you face with this next biennium, most of your cutbacks are being made at the administrative level? Because you geared up administrative? Every one of them was made at the administrative and staff level, none at the instruction, because we're, we operate on the same instructional costs as all of the other institutions. You expect then the cost of student, per student, to drop in the next biennium? As the enrollment grows. But think, you're not being say, allowed to grow. Could I say something about startup costs? Evergreen started up with a cost per student of, in our first year of just under $3,000. This year, even with, or this coming biennium, even with many fewer students than were originally expected, we'll be down to about $2,650, only $50 above one of the other universities. Startup costs for other institutions, the same age, and with like expectations on the part of the public, for example, Governor State or Sangamon State in Illinois or the new uh, New York State colleges at Purchase and Old Westbury, run from $6,900 per student to $10,000 per student. And here we've gotten one of the most remarkable beginnings in American education here in Washington for under $3,000 per student. In effect, though, the reins have been put on you. You cannot increase your enrollment size because of the dictate of the legislature. They say no more money for that kind of thing. You have, in effect, a campus the size or smaller of many high schools in the state of Washington, what, with 1,800 students, plus a physical plant of $42 million, a beautiful campus. Are you stifled? Are you going to drive students away? No. Is the program going to suffer from it? No. I think, the le first of all, the, the cuts that were made by the legislature were cuts in the sense only that our enrollment growth was slowed. So far as the money we have to do the job with, we were very fairly treated so that the program can certainly go on. And the present physical plant can probably accommodate, well, some of the buildings are phased, so that's a kind of a technical question.
question, but in general, the present physical plant can accommodate about uh, 35, 600 students. So there is room there for growth. And I might say that I think it's a wise thing to grow slower. I think it makes a lot of sense. You don't offer a couple of things. You don't offer much in the area of research or graduate study at all. Is that going to stifle you? Or is it really kind of stimulating not to be burdened with those kinds of things? Well, it's stimulating in many ways. I think eventually, the st as the state comes to expect those other things, uh, we'll have to be prepared to do it. But uh, we've been given the chance to do something new in undergraduate study, and we're going to make sure that's done right before we start trying to build other things. Ken, what about point three? I was going to comment, if I could, on the amount of money involved. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. McCann has accurately characterized it as a slowdown rather than uh, even a maintaining a status quo, because where we had $7.6 million for 1971-73 from the general fund, uh, we're now at $10 million plus mm -hmm. and, uh, for the next biennium. And that's only down about $2 million from the governor's uh, proposal. Mm -hmm. And, of course, even on top of that are the millions of dollars for the building that will be under construction in the next two years. But uh, you asked point three. Uh, what I was doing was breaking down the first two, whether or not the education is there to be had, uh, how it's graded, and whether that grade is transferable. And the third one was this matter of the cost, uh, the taxpayer's dollar, uh, supporting an experimental uh, college. And as I say, if we can get the job done, that's fine. But uh, what I'd like to ask Dr. McCann is, uh, with the kind of educational program you have, is it not going to be necessary to continue the ratio of uh, instructor or professor per student in order to have your contract teaching oh, approach? Definitely. And this will necessarily make the cost higher than at other kinds of schools. No, it won't. We, we determined from the very beginning that if we couldn't do it at the same cost as the other schools were, there was no point in starting. It was very clear that, that taxpayers are not interested in having instructional costs go very much higher. Now, true, the support per student in Washington has been declining for the last several biennia. We pegged our costs for instruction on those present rates, declined as they were. Uh, there are many answers to how we can, why we can do it this way. The, I guess the shorthand one is flexibility. People there are flexible. Is flexibility a deterrent? Because as you publish your catalog each year, it may change totally. Every year. Is that good, Mr. Eikenberg? I question it because I keep coming back to the point, where is the college going to excel? What, for example, at some schools we have uh, outstanding medicine. Mm -hmm at uh, Central, where you were before, I believe. Education and, and, a, and a fine course in nursing and dental hygiene are, are programs that the school is known for. And what will Evergreen do along this line? As the public began to look at higher education with a much sharper eye in the last Ten years or so, it's been discovering that programs that are uh, specifically geared to single occupations, that is, one program per occupation, are on the one hand needed by the state, but they're not needed everywhere in the state. And that there ought to be a uh, rather wide variety of educational options open in order to get the most for the taxpayer's dollar out of the total higher education budget. So that uh, Evergreen does not intend to begin that specialized kind of curriculum that is intended to lead to a specific job at the end of the the course gone through. There's another reason for our not doing that, and that is that the, those kinds of curricula tend to become extremely expensive at the upper levels. 
And well, as long as the state already has them, there's, there's no need for their duplication. What we're, we are intending to do is, I think, summed up very well in that brief quotation from the catalog that I began with, to make it possible to the extent we can. And if we can't, we advise a student to go, to go somewhere else. To the extent we can, help him or her get started in his or her career uh, objectives. And we found that we can go a long way toward doing that with this flexible kind of approach. We've got graduates in uh, insurance sales and in large corporations and state agencies as county planning directors and all, all kinds of occupations. That, Why is the campus needed if you're farming them out, as it were? Well, we're not farming them out uh, in the sense that all of this work is done off campus. I'd say that at any given time, about 10% of our students are on full-time internships. Some of the programs, however, that, it, that depend mainly on the campus for their seminar rooms, for their laboratories, may you know, be off campus on occasion for field trips, you know, if, it's a, if it's a social Mr. Eikenberry, do you question the quote, and I'll use it as a quote, liberal look of Evergreen, whether you class it a hippie, freaky joint or not, I, uh, I don't know. But uh, do you question that as a lawmaker? No. Uh, that, I would say, is a fairly uh, superficial thing that doesn't concern me nearly so much. But it did in an article when you, when you looked at the campus, didn't it? That's right. Because it, I think it has meaning to a lot of people. And I'll have to concede that as I walked through the campus there that afternoon that uh, I was certainly impressed by practically a uniform that seemed to predominate uh, so many of the people that were on the campus. And in response to comments that I received later on, I have gone to other campuses to see whether uh, that kind of uh, atmosphere prevailed. And I didn't find it. I was on the university campus last Friday, for example. But uh, I don't think that's the critical point. Is Evergreen going to survive? You have about 10 seconds. Well, I think any place that sets as its main view learning and just tries in every way possible to get out of people's way while they're learning will survive. Thank you, President McCann of the Evergreen State College and to Ken Eikenberry, state legislator. For Viewpoint, this is Art McDonald. Good day. This is Viewpoint, a public affairs program by KOMO Radio and Television. This inquiry into the vital issues of the Pacific Northwest is produced and moderated by Art McDonald.